All right. So uh, my name is Justin Duncan. I'm with uh, with NCATS uh, Southwest Regional Office down here in uh, in Texas, and I'm coming coming to y'all live from uh, beautiful Prairie View, uh, where we had rain uh, last night. But in any case, um, we're we're here with uh, two really great uh, agriculturalists. Um, first, uh, we've got. Um, Tom Bottoms, he's a general manager at, at uh, Timothy and is that Viggy? Viggy Farming? Viggy, yeah. Mm -hmm. Viggy, Viggy Farming and El Molino Farms in California, Sacramento Valley, Valley, where he develops and oversees fertility and irrigation plans for a 6,000 acre ranch comprised of vegetable, orchard, and agronomic crops. He, he directs uh, regulatory compliance and grant writing for air, water, and soil improvement. He analyzes financial operations and budgets and leads new technology exploration and adoption. He's a co-owner of PB Farming, a fresh market uh, fruit and vegetable production company. He has a PhD from UC Davis in horticulture and agronomy. He's uh, married with three young girls. Uh, he graduated from uh, UC Davis um, with his PhD, and then he got a bachelor's of science in plant sciences from California Polytechnic State University, uh, San Luis uh, Obispo. He was also appointed to the uh, technical, technical advisory subcommittee uh, of the California Department of Food and Agriculture. And today he's going to talk to us about um, some of his uh, farming practices and uh, things that he's learned out there um, uh, growing almonds in, in California. So, Tom, you, you, you're welcome to take it away. Great, thanks. I'm going to share my screen. think. I'm sorry, let me switch this. Can you guys see that? No, no, no. Yeah, we can see it. You can. Okay. That's good. Great. Well, thanks so much for having me. I look forward to um, oops, look forward to uh, the discussion and questions. Um, like Justin mentioned, we're I'm located in the Sacramento Valley, uh, just east of, uh, or sorry, just west of Sacramento and east of San Francisco, almost right between them. And so our operation, um, we're primarily row crop growers, but um, like what we'll talk about, um, a lot of people in the state have transitioned to become. Um, uh, tree nut growers. So uh, we also farm walnuts and almonds um, in this area as well. So uh, what we're going to talk about is relates to both uh, almonds and walnuts and other um, tree crops as well, but specifically about almonds. We've seen in California that the acreage has just taken off in the past 10 years. Uh, there's a number of reasons for that, uh, which we'll discuss, but um, you can kind of see it was in 2012, 820,000 bearing acres. Now it's um, upwards of almost 1.3 or 1.4 uh, million bearing acres with, with plenty more to come. The U.S. supplies about 80% of the total almond production in the world, California, almost 100% of that. You can kind of see the distribution through it, throughout the state. Uh, we're located in Solano County, if you pick that up there on the west coast, um, pointing inwards, uh, right on the border of Solano and Yolo County. The yield of, of, the, of almonds is, is about 2,000 to 2,500 on average, but you can get much greater than that. You can go up to 4,000 pounds of kernel uh, per acre. Uh, at at 2,000, 2,500, depending on the price, obviously, the, that can gross 45 to $5,500 per acre. In California, what that means is that a farm gate value of $5.62 billion. Um, it's a big um, market. It, it is, it, um, it's, a, it's a huge agriculture commodity for the state of California. So what's led to, um, I mean, what has led to this um, almond development um, has been a, been a number of um, reasons for that. Obviously people seek opportunity uh, in terms of um, there's just more money to be made. In terms of our operation, a lack of alternative crops really um, has um, encouraged us to plant more uh, almonds. I mean, in terms of 
we grow processing tomatoes and and sunflowers, uh, but we look for uh, we're always looking for a different rotation, and the lack of rotation um, has caused us to look more towards trees. There's also pressure. Most of our uh, ground that we farm is is leased, so there's a quite a bit of pressure to produce a higher rent crop. Um, and so the landlords want to see consistently high uh, returns for their investment in their in their land. So um, this tree, trees allow that for that. Uh, there's also labor issues. Really difficult to find seasonal labor in, in the numbers that we use. So we, along with processing, do we, we also do um, watermelons and sweet corn and bell peppers, all very labor intensive. Um, and, and not being able to get the labor uh, that we need, uh, we're able to keep uh, a, um, a smaller number of people year round um, in, in, uh, by growing these crops. So with more acres, sometimes there's more problems. Um, and so, um, or there's more opportunities depending on which way you look at it. So in California, it's the last state in the nation to um, have their groundwater regulated. And so uh, this was done by the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. Um, and it was enacted uh, to halt overdraft um, and, and bring groundwater basins into balance pumping and recharge levels by 2040. Now, where we're at in Northern California, uh, we're not, um, we're in a very good situation. I say we're not the best people to talk about it, but we should all be talking about it in this state in California. So uh, in the Southern San Joaquin Valley uh, and in the San Joaquin Valley, um, it, it is, um, this is a very big issue. Um, steps are been, ta been taken for a number of years. And, um, and what we're going to see, uh, likely going to see is land taken out of production if people have almonds or other permanent crops, uh, they're gonna focus their water there and transfer water that from an, what would land be farmed for annual crops to those waters, to the, to the land with um, permanent crops where they have that investment. Um, in terms of the market, uh, the current market for almonds is difficult. Um, there's issues uh, with a large inventory right now and there's shipping issues that are resulting uh, in low prices. And so this is all due to people just putting more almonds in, in the ground and planting more. And so as the acreage increases, we've seen that land goes, has went from very fertile ground to more marginal land. Um, so you kind of it spreads out uh, into the, into the Delta and to, uh, and then up along the foothills. And so as this nut rush continues, we had the gold rush. Now we're in the nut rush orchards, um, are being planted on a lesser ground and uh, which have, bring another set of issues. Um, and so uh, I want to give a little bit of background on just the almon harvest, what that looks like, because that, that relates specifically towards cover crops um, and what we're, what we're trying to do um, in our cover crops, in our, in our orchards. So the almond harvest utilizes uh, the orchard floor for harvest, and and so that um, and so I'm going to walk through a couple steps or walk through what that harvest looks like so you can get a better idea. On the top picture there, you see a shaker. That machine will come through and basically clamp down on that tree, and and vibrate that tree for uh, and shake it um, for a few seconds. And, and at the right physiological stage, those nuts will all, pretty much everything will fall to the ground. That's the next picture. As they lay there, they will dry for anywhere between five and 10 days. Then the next machine will come through and sweep those nuts into a windrow. And that's where the rows you'll see there at the bottom. Dust is a major issue. This is a, this is a very equipment uh, intensive operation. And while we're going through those orchards to harvest them, we want to reduce as much foreign material as possible. So twigs, plant residue, uh, extra loose soil. We want, a, we want a flat and a residue and a hard surface to harvest those almonds. And that's usually finished around late October. 
What we're seeing is that a transition um, to different types of harvesting, similar to what pistachios or prunes, if you're uh, familiar with those, is an off the ground harvesting. So what that machine in that picture will do is it'll come up to the tree. It will continue to move. It will have a continuous movement. It will shake that tree and catch catch the bottom, catch the tree and the nuts that are in there and convey them and either put them in a windrow or it will, um, it, it, or it will, it, it could potentially put them um, in some type of uh, in catchment uh, where you can take it out similar to when we use a pickup machine or, or a harvester on the windrows to take them out of the field. If you do that directly from the tree, there's gonna be some drying steps. So at this point, what's happening um, is as they move from off the ground harvesting, they're putting them into a windrow. Uh, we would typically come through with a conditioner, uh, we call it, where it basically picks up the nuts, um, dries them and, uh, and takes out foreign material and lays them right back in that windrow. So that is the current, uh, that's a trend uh, that's going. It's more than just a trend, it is happening. Uh, the machines are getting better. Um, but again, the, the primary focus will continue to be on what is the least um, disruptive way to harvest on the tree for tree health uh, and still get the, the best quality nut off the tree. Sorry, this is not moving. Uh, okay. Okay. In terms of cover crop timing, so oh, I'm moving. Okay. Uh, um, there's after harvest uh, again ends around October, late October. There's a we we do a number of different steps, and depending on the grower, they'll do these different steps um, in different orders. They'll apply um, amendments um, to, uh, I mean, in, in our situation, we usually apply a gypsum with high, high magnesium soils, um, pretty neutral pH. We'll apply those amendments. Um, and at some point, we'll, uh, there's an option to spray the orchard floor if needed. On mature orchards, because we've just done this intensive harvest, the orchard's left with very few weeds, if anything. Uh, but for young orchards, pre preparing, um, for the years ahead, you might decide to spray the orchard floor, 100% spray. We would float the orchard like in the bottom picture there with what we call a V blade. Again, we're trying to make that as flat as possible. In that harvest, you tend to leave, leave a bit of a ridge um, there so we can kind of flatten that out and move that dirt around as needed. We'll spray the berms, that area where the trees are planted um, specifically, um, and then we'll plant a cover crop. And that's, and that's uh, that bottom picture. Um, and we could potentially irrigate that cover crop as well. One small note, the picture on the top right, what you see is some residue from pruning. So uh, the, both the pictures on the top, those are very young orchards. Uh, they come, we come through and prune them. We don't prune them as heavily as we used to. Uh, we prune them once basically, and then maybe a second year do a few cuts. Um, but once that prunings are, are in that orchard, we'll come through and shred those prunings and leave them right in the orchard. We do not take out any prunings or burn them anymore. Everything is left in the orchard. So that's all part of the thinking through, if we're gonna plant a cover crop, if we're gonna harvest this off the ground, we need to, or on the ground, we need to think through what that residue is gonna look like. In terms of equipment used, you can use a wide variety of equipment. I would say use whatever works for you. Um, so here's two different no-till drills. We've, I've seen people do it with a broadcast. Um, just I've seen people do it with grain drills. All these different things require a certain amount of preparation prior. With the no-till drill, it's bulletproof. Um, they're not cheap, um, but we've invested. In, we feel like this is something we're, we're going to do long term, so we've invested. Here's two different models. Both are from Great Plains. One has the coulters that are built in, the disc openers that are built in uh, to the machine. It's a 10 foot, um, uh, 10 foot drill on top. And then the bottom is a 12 foot drill and that's got a, a separate attachment. Um, once you get it um, a little bit wider, uh, it's difficult. So we, it'd be difficult because the trees get so big. I'm gonna play a video. I'm hoping it's gonna work where you can um, take a look at what that, seating look like.
So these are third, what we call third leaf or third year almonds. Again, you can put a wider drill on these as the, as the trees get bigger, uh, we would need to go down to a 10 foot drill, uh, which we do. So that's what that, that's what that would look like. Um, again, these are heavy. Um, the no-till drills are heavy as you, as many of you know, uh, and they just, and, and, and these floors are really hard. So it works out pretty well to just put them in the ground. We do not usually wait for a rain to soften anything because it, in California, it's really difficult to depend on a rain. So uh, when, in terms of destruction of that um, cover crop, we typically ch chop it in March or April. Two different types of choppers can be used. One's a flail mower and one's a rotary mower. The flail mower's on the left and the rotary's on the right. And so uh, that, the flail mowers are really good. Depending on this, it all depends on the species and how fast you wanna go, how high you wanna cut it. Um, we usually, we, we like to use a rotary mower to go through the first time. It's a lot faster, cuts higher. Um, these flail mowers really get bogged, can get really bogged down, though they can chop it really nicely. The bottom two pictures are after the flail mower went through. Um, it, can, it can really break it up. Again, almost all of the irrigation that we have uh, in this particular orchard where the, where the, um, that flail mowers looks, we have a combination of micro sprinklers and buried drip systems, so to a line on each side of the trees. Um, and in the season, we'll run all only drip. And so what that will do is basically just dry out that cover crop there. There will be, uh, we're not worried about it desiccating and really drying down because after a whole season, that will become just basically dirt and nothing. So there's this mulching effect that happens in terms of keeping weeds down, which we'll talk about, but it's a pretty um, straight, it, it, it dries down pretty quickly. In terms of different species used, we've tried a lot of different types of species. Currently the species that we're, or the, the mix that we're doing using the most is this one on the left where it's a 30% belt. You can read the percentages. We really like it because the daikon radish is big and it and it really um, goes down. A lot of growers are bit, might be a bit afraid of that, um, but we really like it because it opens up the ground quite a bit. And it has these different legumes with it to kind of support that and also the early uh, for the trees. So this um, particular mix breaks down really easy. A lot of those stems are really hollow and um, it just, it just kind of melts away which again, if, if our goal is to have this cover crop, have it big and then have it go away really quick, it works really well. We also tried different, this year we did mustard, just 100% mustard. Um, and that was, that was good. The, the issue with the mustard is it, it can get kind of ropey and difficult to break down over time. So um, it, it, it becomes, it's definitely more fibrous. Uh, although it gets big and uh, it comes on really late and it's got some nice flowers towards after the pollination. We've also done some ryegrass. Um, it, we do ryegrass uh, on our newly planted orchards. We can either decide to keep them as a cash crop or just keep the uh, and, and harvest it or just have the ryegrass between the rows. Both the mustard and the ryegrass were in response to cost as those were very cheap. Uh, even the mix is much cheaper in the past. You can see the mixes that we did a couple, we've been doing these perennial clover blends and this wildflower erosion blend. Those are quite expensive, um, really nice. They take some different type of management when we do this perennial cover crops. These perennial cover crops um, require us to, to require them to stay in the field much longer than the annual crops or than, than, the, um, than the crops we're currently using. So we'll take them all the way to seed, dry them out, and then there's a push to try to deal with the residue. So uh, we'll chop it, irrigate it, chop it again, and just continually trying to work that down where it's harvestable. We did not, we've had some success with that and some failures and some, we've had a lot of residue in our harvesting, making it really difficult. Uh, and the, all of these um, are difficult. I mean, are the intent of the all of flowers, except the ryegrass, obviously, um, but, but the timing for the bees, we really want them to flower before the, uh, before the almonds. It's been really difficult to make that happen. We can get them all the flower, they're all flowering right now, uh, right as we chop them, but it's usually after the almonds flower. And so um, 
the feed is after the fact, it's, it's difficult to get it before just in terms of uh, how cold it is usually when, when uh, we want them to flower. There's a number of issues uh, with cover crops and we could talk all day about them. And this is why a lot of more people don't do them. Uh, in terms of water use, um, there, there are times where you we might have to have to um, irrigate that cover crop up. We rarely do this though. We try to, we think if we put a seed in a dry ground and put it shallow enough, uh, we've had more issues putting it deeper than shallower. Um, then when the rains come, that, that, will, that seed will germinate. Um, there are issues of harvest in terms of the amount of residue um, and, uh, and just dealing with that. Other difficulties in management, um, there's, there's plenty. There's, there's a, you have to really think through the different steps of what's it gonna take from harvest to, uh, to being completely done um, in, in, terms of, in terms of chopping that cover crop. So the different, every, every piece that you're gonna, now every cultural practice that you'll do, you'll have to think about how this cover crop, it's just one more uh, piece of that. Weed control. Some of these cover crops are going to come back. I would contend that you have better weed control with the cover crop. Um, we've seen that many, we've got a lot of evidence for that. Winter sanitation, we're going to talk a little bit more about that in the next, um, in the next few slides. Um, vertebrates, there are more vertebrates. We see a lot more um, coyotes and rabbits and squirrels and, and gophers and so on. But um, these are all things that we can, we contend with whether we have a cover crop or not, we feel like. So uh, frost risk, this is a big one. So this year in California, our, our crop and for the almond crop in California is off between 20 and 100%, depending on what grower you talk to. Um, we had some very cold temperatures. And so with that cover crop it tends to increase or decrease, excuse me, decrease the temperature. If you, if you have not chopped that cover crop, if you kept it there, tends to decrease the temperature two or three degrees, um, especially lower in the tree canopy, uh, which is might be just enough to cause some serious damage. Okay, so we're looking at the difference of, if, uh, we had some temperatures um, that got into 24, 25 range, and we see damage with the trees around 27, 28. Uh, and so it's an important piece to think about. I don't, I, and so what we, what you can do and what we've done in the past is, is we go through and we just chop the cover crop um, before this frost comes. Although that's not a, it's not a hundred percent. I mean, bare soil is warmer than even a mulch. And so um, there's some issues with some frost that we need to think about. And there's some costs and uncertainties about the economic return of the cover crops. So we'll talk a little bit about, about that going forward, but um, there's some challenges there. Benefits, um, you guys you, you could probably talk through this slide better than I can, but we've seen that in cover crops, it was just an increase in soil biological activity. Um, there is increased water infiltration. It's a cooler, uh, the surface is cooler. Uh, and then the, um, it compared to a bare soil surface where you have um, this water that's running off um, increased soil temperature. And then uh, this, I mean, it's a, this is a big deal for us for water infiltration. As we talk about trying to refill uh, and really take care of the aquifers, we want as much of this water that lands on our property, on our land to go down instead of running off. Um, and so this, this we feel like certainly helps when we have big um, rat, daikon radishes and, and different crops that allow the water to go down, uh, it's certainly helpful. You can see the difference in what that looks like in the two pictures. The top picture is a bare, bare soil um, where there's, 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 there's nothing planted there. And that's just, this is actually one of our orchards as well. Um, this is the last one that we, we, we're gonna put this into a cover cropping this next year compared to the cover crop below. We, all, we plant cover crops on old orchards too. A lot of people say we just do it on young orchards, but uh, on older orchards, though the stand might not be quite as good, it is still still very strong and still very helpful. Other other pieces, um, there's um, in terms of trafficability, 
it's really improved. Uh, it, it allows us to come in there uh, for winter sanitation and spraying. So in Ammons, the top picture there, you show, it shows you the old Ammons on the tree. Um, it's in the, this is very important as we have some major uh, navel orange worm issues. Um, so they'll overwinter in what we call the mummy nuts. We wanna get in there and shake or use poles to get those uh, um, on the ground and ideally swept up and chopped again to break up that life cycle. We'll also come through with a sprayer and spray those trees. Um, you can see the sprayer there going right through the cover crop. We'll come through and either chop it before or after, but regardless, we will never take the cover crop out only because we're going through with the sprayer. We'll just run over it. Uh, and so, um, but it allows, especially when it's wet, that cover crop allows for better trafficability. We can get across those much better than our neighbors uh, that do not have a cover crop there. In terms of soil structure, we'll have increased infiltration. Uh, we, we see that uh, we get, the water goes down, it does not run off. Uh, and that risk of runoff during rain events is, is reduced or eliminated. We have better water imp imp penetration and improved soil aggregation. I will say this, I don't wanna make it sound like these cover crops are just a soil fit, uh, cure all. Uh, there's been some really good research out of UC Davis uh, that says these conditions just revert back to the original infiltration, original aggregation post cover crop. And that's true because we're, there's not really an incorporation uh, of this cover crop. We are chopping it, leaving it, letting it dry. Um, and, and so it, we don't want to, I don't want to make it sound like we're, we're, this is a soil health miracle. We are doing it at a, at a, pre, in a practical level. There are some great soil health benefits, uh, but, but there are some limitations in what we can do as well. We've seen some reduced dust because even though we try to reduce the amount of residue, there is some residue, much more residue there than just a, than just a soil surface. Um, we do not see increases in soil organic matter. Um, that's been shown across a lot of different cover crops. Again, we do not incorporate this material it tends to just dry up and increasing soil organic matter takes a lot of organic matter. What is really helpful is that our soil cracks, again, these high magnesium soils, high clay soils, um, they, we have these large cracks. Uh, those cracks tend to fill in with the residue. Uh, and so that's been really helpful. So one thing we can, we would typically have to do is go through there and turn the irrigation water on uh, to let those cracks heal up by doing a cover crop over time, those cracks will fill in with residue and it won't be an issue. In the top picture on the right, you can talk about um, we, this. Again, we can produce a harvestable cover crop in terms of uh, if you want to do triticale or, or some type of haylage, or, or in this case, um, this is a ryegrass, which we may or may not choose to, har um, to harvest. We always think we focus on the primary crop. The primary crop is the almonds. And afterwards, if we can get a secondary crop, that's fine. And another piece is the feed for bees, like we talked about. We talked about the timing of that's not perfect. We haven't figured it out. Other people have, and more power to them. But our, our, we're, we're primarily going for biomass and other benefits. The bees, there's a lot of feed after the almonds are, um, have been pollinated. So beekeepers love us. Some people get um, price breaks on their bees for that. Uh, we're not able to get flowers prior to the um pollination. That's the one thing that you love to see, but um, we just can't get the cover crop planted enough and can't get the temperatures warm enough. In terms of economics, this is really rough, and this is this is what this is what I see. Um, and a seed can have a wide range, anywhere from six dollars to fifty dollars an acre. A custom planting rate at $30. Again, we've decided to invest in no-till drills, uh, but you can get somebody to plant it for you. Uh, an additional chopping at $10, it might be a little bit low, but that's about what it would be. Uh, it'd give you $60. Now, if you wanted to choose to put an extra irrigation on, um, if you wanted to put some chemical or spray out prior to planting the cover crop, again, we just plant right into it. We don't spray out anything um, because we feel like the cover crop's gonna outcompete it. We don't mind weeds growing in it, because it's, it's cover over uh, as opposed to bare soil. What's the yield benefit? We're still learning that. 
Um, it can, it, I mean, if it, we, we don't, it's difficult, it's really difficult to quantify. Um, and so if potentially it's 50 pounds or um, 100 pounds or 200 pounds, 300 pounds at $1.60, you can see the potential benefits. So does it pencil? Absolutely. A lot of people would say it does pencil, but I'm not going to stake my claim on that and say it does because uh, we just, we need more information. Uh, so it's difficult to quanti quantify direct cost savings or the benefit thereof, uh, but we do see this as being a long-term investment. Here are the flowers on the right that we do see right now. Um, again, it's great feed for the bees, but, but it's a little bit late. There's some great programs, wonderful programs who have helped us out and we wouldn't be anywhere without that. We have um, NRCS um, has been great. Um, the Healthy Soils Program in the state of California helps fund, um, it's similar to NRCS, it's about, it's a matching program to help um, with, um, with a number of healthy, with, with soils practices uh, and uh, cover crops and composting and uh, whole orchard recycling, all these different things are part of that. Uh, USDA programs, there's a project APSM, which is a Seeds for Bees program, which has been really helpful, great, very knowledgeable. The NRCS staff, university staff, seed companies, and other farmers, all these folks, I mean, there's, we've created such a good community to help with the cover cropping. In our area, we see a lot, a lot of cover crops. And it's, and it's, it's particularly important in Northern California as we, um, as we just have more rainfall and, 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 and uh, wetter springs and we need to get equipment and, and different reasons. So uh, we found it to be really helpful. I'm looking forward to you guys' questions. Here's my contact information if you ever want to call or send me an email and have questions about that. But I appreciate your time. Uh, and look forward to your questions. Yeah, so I've got a quick, I've got a couple of questions, um, and since I'm the moderator, I can I can do that, right? Um, first, I'm from Texas. We say almond, but you mm -hmm. say almond, and it, I I'm likening it to the difference between some people saying salmon and some people saying salmon. Yeah. But what is that original thing or or what what's it, going on? Is that only for the initiated almond uh, almond growers that say almond? It is it is uh it's a regional thing. So on the I think the more northern California growers would say almond, southern California growers would say almond, but um I I would say whatever makes money is good. Sounds good to me. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I like that. Hey, I like Justin. That. Yes, sir. Justin, I think um that part of the harvest, um, they they shake the L out of them. That's right. <laughs> ah, that's cute. That's cute. Okay, so my next question is a little bit more serious. Now, um, now I, I'm I'm a cover crop guy down here in Texas, and we just finished up our uh, conservation innovation grant with uh, with NRCS uh, to look at cover crops down in South, in extreme South Texas. Um, so I, I was concerned when you said that. You know, when you grow the grow the cover crops, that it cools it down to the point where frost can actually damage it, and and that's that's interesting to me because it makes sense because the ambient temperature is going to be lower if you grow cover crops, but I've I've never seen that as an issue because, like I said, we're in Texas; it's a lot hotter here. Mm -hmm. and like when when you see that. You know, cover crops are having this effect with the with the frost differences. That is that is really amazing to me. Um, so, so yeah, um, I don't know. Could you could you address yeah, that a little bit? On, um, physiologically, the the stage at which we have the cover crop and and the stage actually of the almond, it's it's really a critical time, and there's not much we can do about it. So there's a few. Um, so, so it's right, right at pollination, and then right at that nutlet formation. And so you have this temperature that, if it gets below, like I said, 27, 28 for even just 30 minutes, it will, it will abort those flowers, and we can see it. We can see it the next day, right? And so uh, there are p things we can do. Again, we can talk about trying to remove the cover crop or, or chop it. Uh, we can turn, we, we, we go through and turn, um, if we have micro sprinklers in that orchard, we'll turn them on a few days ahead of time to try to get more evaporation to, to warm up those orchards. But it's really trying, we're playing with a degree or two um, because in our situation, 
you can lose. I mean, you, it's it's the difference between having a crop and an insurance claim. So wow, that that is really that is really something to think about. I mean, uh, that's really interesting. So um, the other question I had about that was, it seems like you know because the um, the way that you harvest the, the the almonds and you need to have the hard surface and all that, that this is counter, kind of counterintuitive when it comes to growing cover crops because cover crops are going to soften up your soil mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. they're going to be in the way and they're not going to, they're mm -hmm. not going to conducive to that smooth surface. Mm -hmm. But we know that the uh, cover crops increase your organic matter con uh, uh, content mm -hmm. soil. So is there, have y'all seen like noticeable trade-offs in these orchards that um, have the additional uh, organic matter accumulation in the soil versus the harvestability of those those hard surfaced fields to be honest with you just well, i've only seen a benefit and so um in terms of looking at the organic matter percentages you typically don't see that much like an increase in um, a percent or two i mean it, it's really difficult to to get to that point but um but what we do like i said is when you're looking at cracked soil and you're saying about constant residue put back into the soil we see the surface really sealing up, um, and 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 so there's a lot of residue there, um, and and that's got to go somewhere. A lot of it goes into the air as it as it just dries out, but there's a fair amount that stays. And especially if you take these perennial cover crops, you have these high carbon, um, uh, higher carbon um, cover crops at the end, and you just kind of work them down, work them down, work them down. Uh, you will see benefits, and it has been. Uh, a real benefit in harvest. Again, if you can keep that residue low, if you've got, a, we've, we've had it where we're looking at an orchard a few days before and we're looking at a couple inches of, of plant matter that's just dried, that's a problem. That's a real problem for us. And, and we've been there, but we've learned from it. And so this is why we do this use, typically lean on these uh, cover crops that just kind of melt away, break down really easily. The legumes, these brassicas, as opposed to the, a lot of these grasses that we take um, these perennial ryegrasses and different things that take a lot to break down this medic, burmetic, this, I mean, which is great, but getting those seeds to break down is really difficult. And I was going to ask which medic, but you answered that already. So the, the last thing I wanted to really address was, um, on these, uh, on these orange navel worms, um, yeah. have you tried like spraying, uh, Bavaria bassiana on that residue to, to try to, um, eat up those worms. I haven't no, um, and again, most of them overwinter in the nuts that are that are on in the tree itself, huh? and so the, the, so the idea is if you get them on the ground, typically it 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 re, they they'll die off, but the ones that are in the tree are there. That's a real problem. But I have not tried that. I'll I'll, I'll look into it. Yeah, because it's it's very uh, it's very effective against a lot of cryptic insects. You know, things that that mm -hmm. high have a dormant dormant. Um, mm -hmm stage so that mm -hmm. that might be a, an option for y'all okay thanks hey, no problem um oh and just out of curiosity what is uh where to go what's a what's a dundale bean yeah more like a cow pea kind of kind of thing um yeah so, okay i think so, i'm not an expert so <laughs> all right all right okay i guess with that um since we're gonna hold off on on uh, viewer questions until the until the end, uh, we're gonna switch over to uh, to Dr. Chris uh, uh, Grodegut, and um, he's a veterinarian, a farmer, and a stockman in Hereford, uh, Texas, located up there in Death County. Um, that's in the Texas Panhandle. Um, that area of Texas has a rich agricultural uh, heritage. And its economy is built on the waters of the Ogallala Aquifer, which the Ogallala, if you, if you don't know, is is under severe threat in in, uh, in western Texas. Um, so over the past hundred years or so, um, you know the uh, Ogallala has been depleted by uh, you know constantly growing uh, row crops and plowing and and all that sort of thing. And all that, a lot of that land is being turned into um, feedlots for uh, cattle. So aquifer decline is a, seriously, a serious threat uh, to the longevity of many producers in the Texas Panhandle. Uh, Chris is taking steps on his land to replenish the aquifer, and he freely shares his lessons learned along the way. 
Um, so he's got an 11,000 acre farm there named uh, Tierra de Esperanza um, that produces organic crops and livestock. In recent years, he's transitioned the family operation towards more efficient uses of water, labor, and equipment by returning much of his cropland back to native grass pastures. Uh, he plants winter crops over dormant grasses in years with favorable moisture. And y'all understand that the panhandle is pretty dry. I mean, it's not exactly like the desert, but it's, it's, pretty, it's got pretty low uh, rainfall. Um, uh, he... He, um, he minimizes irrigation and takes uh, measures to protect his playas, which are the clay basins in his fields and pastures that infiltrate water very slowly to refill the aquifer below. He has a DVM from Texas A&M University. Go ahead, Chris. Okay, welcome everybody. Tom, you did a great job on your presentation. Now we're, this, this is going a different direction and hopefully everyone gets something out of it. Uh, Basically, we're located southwest of Amarillo, Texas, in a normal 18 to 20 inch rainfall zone. Uh, we are in a zone that would be considered uh, on the edge of what uh, people term less than 18 inches. They view that as rangeland country and more than 18 inches. They view that as pasture land country. And, and so it's a little bit different on how some people manage it. But what we've learned here is that, you know, the, the principles across the board, whether you're in California or whether you're in Iowa or whether you're in West Texas, they all have a play. And, and learning those principles, uh, those good soil health principles to help us operate better is very important. It, it's also been one of those deals of, 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 trying to figure out um, in, our, in our scenario, we're going away from, we, historically we've been a row crop production farm and we're moving away from that, but we're still keeping a piece of it. And so um, we're trying to adapt to, to uh, the climatic condition changes that we deal with in a very sustainable fashion. And to do that, we kind of came into this soil health deal a little backwards. Uh, our concern was what was, was a declining water table. And we knew we had some evidence that, uh, that there were times that we could see some rises in the aquifer, but the overall trend was negative and, and it still is across our region. But what we've learned is from a farm scale perspective. Uh, so we tried to make an observation of identifying the problem of our water tables going down. The, the question we had was, how do we, is, is it even possible to stop a water table decline with neighbor pumping and, and many different ideas of what's going on? I mean, Tom, Tom knows this well, that um, an acre of almonds definitely out produces an acre of corn silage in, in California. And so in our region, we've had a, a over the last 20 years, uh, across the Great Plains, we've had more and more growth in, in uh, animal and confined animal agriculture, uh, some cattle feeding, but particularly uh, the dairy industry and things like that. So we're trying to adjust the water available and the usage of how we're, how we're going to adapt to the future here. And um, so our big resource concern started off as water. And what we learned is that um, we had to, we went down a little different path and we went down and started putting in perennial grasslands as our covers. In our area, if we have to depend upon irrigation to get cover crops up, we view that water is too valuable to do that. And, and so we tried to look for plants. We played with some different perennial cover, I mean, non-perennial covers, and we just couldn't find a consistent product. And so we're in a we're in a in a large landscape area, you know. We're fortunate our farm is contiguous. All the wells are tied together. We're pulling water out of the Oglala Aquifer and out of a out of a level below that. So we're pulling water from as deep as about 800 feet deep, and as shallow as about 250 feet deep. So we pumping cost is certainly an issue in our region. So we went down this path 
of putting in native grasses. And it's a slow process. It is not an on-demand deal because we chose to put in perennial grasslands on our land by um, just planting the grassland and letting mother nature take care of it when it comes, when we get some things coming. So the pictures in front of you is a, is a field that, that we put into grass. It's, that's grass establishment. If you, if you see uh, on the picture on the, on the left, the right hand side of that picture, there's some grass established right there. Further in, which that's a grass corner of a pivot, further in is where the grass was just planted the year prior, and that's actually weeds. So, hey, Chris, weeds, yes, can you hear could me? Could you share your screen? Oh, I thought I was. I'm sorry. Let me get it on there. Let me see if I can get to it. Let me get to it. Hold on. Let me find. Okay. Let me get back to sharing the screen. Give me a second. Let me start this thing back. Okay, we'll try to share the screen again. Okay, there we go. You see that? Yes, sir. Okay, I'm so sorry. I thought I had it on there already. Okay, my bad. So, Chris, it's in presentation mode. Could you put it in? Or it's in uh, yeah, I'm edit putting mode. in view mode. I'm gonna move the mode. Yes, I am doing it. There we go. Back to slideshow mode. Okay. There. Now can everyone see it? All good. Okay. So in our scenario, we're we're basically I should have asked if everyone saw my screen before I started. My bad. Um so in our region where we're trying to to adapt to to the future of our region that becomes a bit of a, a, it's a bit of an issue with the changes that have come here. And so uh, what we've come to, we, we decided that the most adaptive plant to our region is, is the native grasses that were there eons before we plowed it up, before people before us uh, plowed it under, okay? And we're fortunate from the standpoint we have no, uh, landlords on any of our property. Our property is either fully owned or, or I'm still paying, my wife and I are still paying for it uh, through our land company, which is Terra Esperanza. And so uh, that, that gave us some advantages. We didn't have to ask anyone if it was a good idea or not. We just took the experiment and went forward with it. So to backstep a bit, uh, we're about 12 years into this experiment. And it started off by us just planting corners and grassland. Uh, we, we water with center pivot irrigation with uh, LEPA heads on them, which put the water real close to the ground and uh, basically run them mostly in bubbler mode. We do run it some in spray mode also on certain crop conditions uh, to get the water table to stop declining in our, our area what we learned was that uh, we needed to get rid of some pivots. So we reduced our pivot uh, load tremendously. And in doing so, we reduced our tractor load significantly and our labor pool significantly. And, and so on the picture on the screen, I am actually a, a full-time practicing veterinarian and a full-time farmer. So I, we run pretty hard. And the gentleman on the screen there, near the shredder, he is my one farm employee. And so we run a very, a very lean operation. And, and, and yet we still deal with, we deal with uh, crops that are, uh, our main crop is wheat production, which is pretty simple. Um, and we do something that is a little different than a lot of operations. We actually no-till uh, we have a John Deere seeder that we no-till directly into the grasslands uh, to get our wheat production on the dry acres. Uh, so when we got rid of pivots, we basically parked 75% of our pivots and sold them. And we found out that we could operate somewhere between 10 and 25% of our land is full or partially irrigated ground on an annualized basis and, and maintain a stable aquifer. 
uh, depending upon how much rainfall we do or do not get. So currently we're in a pretty hard drought uh, in the region, at least where we're in drier weather, we start, but our farm doesn't seem to be experiencing the drought near as severely as many of the other operations in the area, mainly because of the biomass and protection of the soil from those native grasses. Uh, and so when we plant these native grasses, it takes us anywhere from one to five or six years to get those established. And we have done some cases where we don't even plant it, we just let them come back. Uh, and, and we've had some good results where we did that. Uh, but initially we did, we did choose to plant the corners of the pivots initially. And then we did, we liked those results we were getting. And so we started taking pivots out of, out of production, putting whole, whole quarter sections, every pivot in our place, except one is a, is a 122 acre pivot. And, and that's on 160 acres of land on that quarter. And so uh so we think in terms of whole section 640 acre blocks and and 160 acre blocks in our region um and so because of the amount of livestock that we did not have enough of we had to opt out to this and, and do this process of, sh of shredding and um that is a 30 foot schulte shredder made in canada that we used to shred with it's a it is a rotary cutter, it is not a flail cutter. That's what that is. And so we went down this road of how do we keep the cover on the ground and minimize the soil disturbance? Hold on two seconds, hold on two seconds. We have a visitor talking, okay. Hold on two seconds. Now we did say that he's a DVM, so yes, I'm back. We had an animal who recovered from surgery earlier. I've been, I've, been, I've spent the morning listening to your talks and doing surgery. <laughs> so there we go. And I'm, I happen to be looking at the recovery ward from this morning. So the last one is awake and alive and going to be ready to go home. So okay. Uh, so basically, where we're at. We, we went down that road of trying to find the, the ideal situation. We tried, you know, our annual crops and our rainfall is just too sporadic to make them work. Uh, when we get wet cycles, if we look at El Nino patterns, we tend to be wet on the Southern Plains. And we tend to be wet enough that we can make very comparable yields in grass planting and grasslands to planting on on traditional spray no-till or traditional um, tilled uh, ground. And so the advantage of what we're doing that's so different than a lot of people is that we have eliminated our fallow period. We don't have a fallow period anymore we, because if it's either growing, that ground's either growing grass or it's growing uh, plants that people would determine that they would call weeds that we would graze or it's planting a cash crop uh, such as um, predominantly wheat. We have done some sorghum in the pro process and sorghums do work in this process pretty well uh, mainly because um, their height is above the, above the, the, na the native grasses. We're in an area of the country that's considered short to mid grass country. And so our grasses typically don't get that tall. Um, they tend to be shorter in stature. So plants that can grow above that, that we can mechanically harvest with uh, a combine harvester work, work, work really, really well in that scenario. Um, the problem we run into is, is uh, the, the tr A, the cost of the transition. It's not significant. I mean, it's about $65 a year, an acre to plant the grass. Um, but the, the first few years we put grass in, we typically don't, even if we have a wet year, we typically don't seed it into uh, crops. So we tend to try to let the grass establish and we get some grazing off of it, but we don't try to overgraze that period 
we pound, we, we, we're short duration, long recovery grazing is what we do. And, and so um, we try to manage it that way. And so the advantage of, of what we've got going on is we're putting in there, we're putting blue grama and green sprinkle top and buffalo grass and side oats grama, which are all native to our region. Um, and, and our crop now, instead of corn or grain sorghum or wheat on the dry years is grass. And our crop on the wet years is a cash crop plus grass which then, then is used by our sheep and our cattle production. Um, and so we've kind of gone down this road of how do we, how do we address um, cutting our cost? How do we address having a business that will be here that can be viable for a thousand years or more? And um, it led us back to putting putting the land in a much more natural state. And, and by doing that, so we, we basically, I mean, our costs are pretty simple. Our costs are, if we need, if, if our soil testing uh, indicates that we need to apply uh, compost or, or beef cattle manure to the ground, additionally, we can do that easily. We are in an area that feeds, um, a significant number of cattle in, in confinement and, and there's a significant amount of dairy manure also available in the area. So from a fertility perspective, it, even though it's not perfectly balanced, that's a pretty cheap source of, 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 of nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, so what you're looking at here, you're looking at wheat that is coming up in the grassland plant in the fall after the grass has gone dormant. So we tend to plant, that grass starts going dormant uh, mid-September and it gets fully dormant by mid-October, early November. So we, we like to start planting into the grasslands about mid-October, which happens to coincide with the optimum planting date on wheat. And when we do that, uh, we grow that wheat and take it off as normal harvest. Um, and when we take it off, so this on the on the right, the screen on the right is the grass growing back through the wheat. There's some weeds growing up in there also. This was one of those you're not supposed to do deals on the on the right, uh, but it worked very well. Uh, that field uh, it didn't generate a super high yield, but in our area, uh, a normal dryland wheat will average uh, 25 bushels on a normal year. Uh, with with uh, moisture conservation, get up into 40, 45 bushels. That field was planted to grass the year prior that went to wheat, and it was planted to wheat in the fall, and we planted wheat right into it where that, pit, that, where that picture was taken. And uh, when we cut the wheat off, the grass came through, just exactly like Colin Sice would say. And, and so we have seen really good success with it. That, that field there, uh, still harvested 45 bushel wheat off of it, which was not bad. We have seen wheat yields on, on dry land exceed 100 bushels an acre in places on the farm or in quarter, you know, we, we measure everything by quarter sections, so on a quarter section. But on normal, if the county best operators are under conventional tillage or no-till are making uh, 60 bushel, we're 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 not we're we're matching them up right there with significant lower cost of production, because we've cut out all of the the chem fallow and the, and the tillage work that might have been done to manage that ground. So to, to give you an idea of cost savings on it, we went from running five uh, 250 to 320 horse tractors and one uh, 400 horsepower plus four wheel drive to running one 320 horsepower tractor. So our overheads, uh, along with a, a, an air seeder, along with a, gra a Great Plains uh, grass drill, and we have a, um, a max emerge type uh, uh, planter if we want to plant 30 inch rows. So we plant seven and a half inch rows and 30 inch rows. Everything's, everything's tied into those two numbers. But um, what we get into, so we, we rotationally graze these sheep and cattle around on the farm. And, 
and and we utilize them uh, because that is in our region of the country whether people want to realize it or not to stabilize the water table if, if you can only irrigate 10 to 25 percent of your ground on a given basis you've got to do something with that ground to generate some revenue in the years that you're not producing a grain crop off of it so in the la nina years like we're in right now there's no way you're going to produce a grain crop off of any of it unless it's got irrigation because we probably we probably since planting we have not had three inches of moisture on that wheat um but the irrigated but but that we still have the ability to produce some irrigated irrigated wheat and so what we do we rotationally graze with uh with we, we're still at the point of hot wires we move hot wires so we make our cell size match what we're trying to do to get the right animal impact on a given field so some areas we graze longer and and in other areas we graze very short duration periods and very high intensity numbers uh it, it it just every spot on the farm is at a different stage because we don't control when that grass emerges that is truly a mother nature deal uh on that on that and so the big changes that we've done as far as the livestock goes we don't we don't buy any hay anymore we graze everything we 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 have a small cafe that we use just to in, in for better management of livestock like pregnancy detection testing and sorting and things like that um holding up bulls during when the during the non-breeding season or holding up rams during the non-breeding season uh because of where we live we actually import more uh nutrients on the ground because of the relatively good cost on the on the compost and manure at this point than we export so whatever grain we produce we calculate that nutrient load that we're taking off the land and making sure that we we apply that back and then some uh but still start still because of soil testing we try to stay in levels that are not going to get us in trouble or get us get us out of balance uh from the livestock species perspective we've found that sheep are really good at eating weeds and they won't even touch the grass sometimes and yet the grass the 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 cattle uh will always almost always go to the to the grass first uh the only time the cattle want to go to the weeds first is whenever uh if the weeds are dry and you get some moisture in there and and they just want that they'll, they'll tend to eat the, on those times and we don't do anything for parasite control in our cattle or our sheep uh we rotate our pastures quick enough and quite frankly we let natural selection take care of it the ones that are not thrifty get cold from the operation and and so our business is focused on reducing input cost and focusing on net profitability for our our climatic conditions that we operate in and it's been a it's been a so what happens on a deal like that when you start moving toward grasslands you do take an income hit for a period of time but once those grasses start setting in and start developing better uh you actually you recover a bunch of that income that you reduced uh because because you're just not spending that much cash money to do it so your cash outlay in your operation is significantly less and you you've taken a lot of the risk of of external things like fertilizer pricing and uh fossil fuel cost out of the equation because when the one trip you're making is planting and the next trip you're making is harvesting um that's a pretty small scheme compared to the models we used to run on uh, so it makes those two variables much much less of an issue for us um so if we look at it historically in our region uh they talked about playa lakes earlier on the edge here is what we that is what we call playa basin that's where uh the majority of recharge in our aquifer system occurs it's very site specific on how well it recharges how functional the playa lake is uh they are critical to our environment so our goal is to by putting grassland taking it back to grasslands we're able to retain a high percentage of that water that hits the ground and keep it on the ground 
And by, and what we're trying to, our goal is to have 90% of it stay in the field where it, it landed, stay on the spot it landed and get absorbed through the fibrous root systems on the, on the grass plants. These roots can go uh, 12 feet or greater. And, and the fact that we have multiple species of grass out there, those roots are all different rooting depths and those different rooting depths pull nutrients and water from different levels. They also allow uh, when water hits the ground because you've got that dense fibrous root system and that is, and you've got decaying roots and you've got new roots that are reforming in those areas. Um, it really turns that, makes that ground very spongy and allows that water to really come in. And, and so when we do that, uh, it really, it really cut our, it didn't eliminate our need for irrigation through the droughts, but in the wet years, there's irrigation is not that important to us. Okay. And the 10% that runs off the field, if, if we have a really big rainfall event, like sometimes our rainfall events may be a 10th of an inch at a time, and then we get a three or four inch rain. And if your ground can absorb that moisture quickly, and, and that may be, that may come in 30 minutes to an hour. So uh, when the, when those uh, those supercells come across your farm and you can hold that water in the field, that is significantly better math than, than having any irrigation cost out there. Um, and the 10% that runs off, we want to catch it in our playa lakes so we can, th those playas are, are very important because during the dry cycles, they crack, they're very dense clay and those bi those cracks are, are big enough you can put your hand in. And when those cracks, uh, when it rains come, that water, initial water that hits those plyas flows in really quickly. And so you have a period of time that on the annular ring of that, like on that picture of that lake on the, on the left, you can see that where, that where that dirt is all the way, where you see it's brown up the edge of that lake. That picture was taken after, after one of those big rainfall events. And that was, that was within a, a day or two of that rainfall event. That's how much that lake has already gone down. Okay. And, and so that is our saving grace in this region. We don't have, we don't have very many rivers that run through this region. It's very, it's relative, it's a relatively flat environment. And, and so we are very dependent upon the aquifer for, for survival here. And by doing that, if we can catch the water in the lake, that needs to be caught in the lake and it, it all goes in and we don't keep very much on the surface very long, then we are, we're lucky because it gets it away from the wind. Our biggest enemy is, is our evapotranspiration rates here, which can be pretty high. Uh, and and as, as we know through uh, these kinds of grassland areas that we're in, that much of the Great, Pla Great Plains is, uh, the less we can lose water for evaporation, the better off we are, the better off we are if we have transpiration, which is a plant growing on, whether it be uh, a plant that someone calls a weed or a plant that someone calls a crop. In, in our mind, almost all of those plants are a crop of some form uh, because of the livestock. And because of that, transpiration is significantly beneficial to us because with evaporation, we get no increase in carbon in our ground. With transpiration, we're putting car we have the opportunity to put carbon back in the soil. And so by doing that, uh, it does help us improve our water holding capacity over time on that farmland and, and grassland. And so we kind of get caught. One of the problems we run into is that federal policy uh, with uh, USDA, particularly the Farm Service Agency, it doesn't really coincide very well with what we're doing because there's no caveat to it. So we're planting a wheat crop and there's no way that they'll certify that as wheat, even though that's the crop we're gonna harvest for grain sorghum, that's what we're gonna harvest. If it's in a grassland, they wanna call it a, um, a multi-species crop or a mixed forage crop. Uh, and so the problem on this situation is that we're doing it, um, without any, uh, on those acres, we're doing it without any federal crop insurance. The RMA, uh, is not involved on in those acres. 
And so we are taking 100% of the risk. But the reality of it is, from a financial perspective, is that anything that doesn't make a crop, we're going to graze and we're going to recoup it through the livestock side. And, and many times, even though we are a certified organic operation and, and, and our crops bring a decent premium to the market, to the, to the commodity cash market, the reality is that oftentimes the pound of lamb or the pound of beef is worth a lot of money. So if it takes you, to give you an example of math right now, lamb is easily sold for $3 a pound, okay? If we're selling lamb at $3 a pound and it takes us six pounds of, of, of forage to bruise that pound of lamb or seven pounds of forage to bruise that pound of lamb, um, that, that pound of forage, you know, at six, pound, at six, six, at six to one conversion on, 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 a grow, on a growing lamb particularly, um, if you can do that, uh, that's not hard to figure out that that's about 50 cents a pound of forage. And that's the whole plant that's or a big or a percentage of the plant. So uh, if you think of that in terms of grain um, and you take uh, just wheat and you say 60 pounds to the bushel, well, that wheat would have to bring $30 a bushel and actually, you'd have to bring sixty dollars a bushel if, if you follow me on it to make up the same amount of money as 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 the as the livestock could generate off of it. And the market's not there. So we like to produce crops because we like diversity, but it's not as essential as as we have often thought in our region. So in our region, we lived in an area that always had livestock production and always had crop production and, and a operator either put on their hat that they were a livestock producer or they put on their hat that they were a crop producer. And they had, it was very difficult for them socially or culturally to cross the line and, and become one or the other. So, and a lot of times I think that was a function of families had uh, two brothers going to farming and you're gonna take care of the livestock and you're gonna take care of the crops and your side is your side and my side is my side. And so, but for operations to be viable going in the future in our region, uh, we're going to have to wear both hats and, and to make it work. And, and to show you, you know, to change tunes a little bit, to go back on this water deal a little bit, that middle deal is a, is a transducer. We have transducers on some of our wells, okay? And that is a rise in the aquifer. The down spikes are when we're pumping them. And, and that give, we, have, we have had up till February the 24th when uh, our, our uh, phone system never, no longer supported. Uh, we went to 5G and it was, it's on a 3G setup. So we have to figure out how we're gonna recapture that data uh, other than going to the well site. But we, we follow that data on a daily basis of what those wells are doing. And so, the big change that we've done by taking it back to a grassland is we're still irrigating some, we're not irrigating as much as we were, but we're, we're doing it with, with a, a rise in our upper water table, which is a little um, different. It's a little bit unheard of. People thought it would take a hundred years or more to, to, to see any rise at all. And, and we're saying that it, that's not true, that, by by putting the the covers back on the grounds but especially these in our case perennial covers on uh, and we don't have it we don't try to have any dead space on those covers i mean we want we want a mat we want a carpet of grass out there or a carpet of grass and legumes uh, and we've seen some native legumes come back in those fields uh we want the, we want that to be there so on the right of that screen just to show you that picture there that's kind of an interesting deal what really intrigues me about this, about the about the the perennial covers, is that underneath that that grass plant that just came up, that that is that buffalo grass plant that's just come up. Okay, it's not, hadn't been there long. That was that picture was taken last spring. We are currently not in our growing season. We're still freezing at night. Um, but underneath that grass plant and across that field that was just the grass was just starting to come up in, uh, there were ant beds associated with the grass plant coming up. I don't know what that means, 
but I found it kind of interesting because that was during uh, last spring when that picture was taken. We were in, we had gone through a drought period last winter and then we got really wet through the summer and now we're back in a drought period. Um, and that was taken when it was still pretty dry out there. So it was really, it's kind of, I think there's a lot of this understanding of organisms out there. I don't think we truly appreciate the diversity and the role players that, that the insects play in helping our, our ecosystem recover. And so our goal is if we can have a healthy ecosystem and a functioning water cycle, then hopefully we'll, we'll improve our nutrient cycling and, and improve our profitability in a very low cost manner. And so in our, you know, in our view, I mean, the realization is the biology does matter. The plants, the plants matter. The diversity of plants matter. In our case, we essentially don't do tillage anymore. We have not done any tillage in, in the last two or three years anywhere on our operation. And before that, we, we skipped it. We started going on the last of the stuff going, that's going to grass. We, we, we panicked and we tilled about 1,200 acres of the ground and decided that was a bad idea. Once we did it, we realized what we were doing was actually going backwards. Um, things that we, we learned on that in our soil, our natural state of our soil being a grassland is we actually have a low nitrogen content in our soil normally. And so if we had, that's or at least available nitrogen, but under the right conditions, when, when we get the moisture, there's plenty of there's plenty of topsoil, plenty of depth there that we can we can we we keep pulling it back up. It's it's since we've gone away from uh, synthetic fertilizers and synthetic uh, pesticides, we have not we have, it really hadn't hurt us. Um, but to uh, we to give you an idea how long it's been, we went we started on this path in into organic agriculture in 2001 and realized that we were wrecking our soils with tillage uh, along the way. And that, that, that also kept, helped us on that deal. Um, other than that, I mean, it was, we basically did a great big experiment on our farm and we, we were fortunate enough to be able to finance that, financially handle it. And we found that by doing the, by changing our model or changing our thinking drastically, it's, uh, it's allowed us to have a property that should maintain its value indefinitely, and it should be able to support some level of agricultural production indefinitely. Um, other than that, uh, I, think, I think it's kind of, it's, it's a different deal. It's, a, it's definitely a different deal compared to our neighborhood. We've had a lot of, it's, we're at the point now where when we started this process and the organics, we were culturing not cool. When we went to the grasslands, we were culturing not cool. And and now, if you come to our region, there's quite a few more organic farmers, and you've got some really smart farmers that are actually starting to follow footsteps on what we're doing, and they and they're they're learning and understanding what we're doing on what on what we're trying to accomplish. And I think that the the be able to stabilize a water table in an area. Um, and still utilize the water for for crop production. I think that uh, that's a that's a pretty priceless problem for our, us to have. And so maybe we need to not in our case we need in much of the Great Plains. Uh, we need to not undervalue what the native scape originally was and how it functioned, and that maybe the reason that, that uh, the springs once flowed here was because of the native scape. And I think over time, less, certainly, certainly less time than we anticipated um, that those things could happen again uh, with broad, broad based adaption. And, and I'm not saying we have the right answer. I'm, I'm not trying to say that. I'm saying that we, our model works in the region we're at following good soil health principles. And we accidentally found out that you can improve the water table and the soil health at the same time um, and cut costs. You can do it all at the same time. Uh, I do think a lot of operators that are going, that, that, that realize I, in our region, at the end of the day, that's what most of it's going to be. 
there's going to be a tremendous amount of land placed back in grassland. Uh, the water will be used in more intensive purposes of, of irrigation. Um, and yet it can't be used in a way that you're pumping your, that eventually you're gonna pump your wells dry. It's just not a viable option uh, unless you, unless you just want to be a gypsy farmer. And so, which that's what some of them have chosen to do. Any questions, comments? I know that was kind of brief and kind of, um, hopefully it was effective. And Hey, Chris, that was that was excellent presentation. Um, really appreciate it. I, I do have a few questions and let me start the camera back up. All right. So um, I, I want I want you to give give the uh, the viewers at home an, an understanding of how big the Ogallala Aquifer is and why why it's so important. The Ogallala Aquifer is uh, the size of the Ogallala is is that it is a, um, uh, it stretches from south of Lubbock, Texas to uh, all the way to uh, up into the very southern end of South Dakota. Uh, there is a break in the Ogallala between the north portions and the southern portions. Uh, it stretches east to west to include it basically encompasses the states of portions of the states of Wyoming, uh, Nebraska, South Dakota, uh, Kansas, Colorado, Texas, and New Mexico. It's not very much into Tex into New Mexico. It's not very much into Colorado. It's not very much into Wyoming, and it's not very much into South Dakota. But in Nebraska, it is the lifeblood of the Sand Hills. I mean, it's it's that and, and the Sand Hills, the grassland in the Sand Hills is what makes that area recharge so well because they have a large area that is not conducive to crop production, and so much of that land is remained in grassland, and so they and and the only difference that we've learned between our soils being a clay loam, and then being more sandy, their rates of recharge are quicker but we get the same effect over time. It just takes us longer. And then, and then transition across Kansas, the Kansas soils kind of have their sandy areas and there's, there's less sandy areas. And in, here in the Texas Panhandle, we're blessed with excellent soil for a semi-arid region. And um, yet we don't have as much water to work with. We don't have as much area that has Ogallala underneath it as, as you do in Nebraska. It's, it's the second largest amount of Ogallala water is in Texas behind Nebraska. Um, in Kansas where it's good, it's good, but it's a huge, it's a huge area and it has, it has it's probably responsible for roughly 15 to 20% of, of, of the crop production in the, in the U.S. And so learning to farm within that, the confounds of what its future lie is really, really important for these communities to be sustainable, um, whether, whether they're irrigated or dry, because that's where they get the drinking water from also. So the, 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 the drinking water is, is a real critical issue long-term, but fortunately we should be able to be, uh, we should be able to adapt. And I think there's a big move on the part of uh, Ply Links Joint Ventures working in uh, in some places and, and Ogallala Commons working in some places and uh, NCAT and NRCS. Um, I think that move toward trying to make the Great Plains more uh, regenerative and long-term viable is really important because it doesn't, it doesn't help if we keep moving agricultural production. We may have to change what we do in a given area to be more adaptable to market conditions or, or, or climatic conditions. Um, but uh, that's that's kind of the that's kind of where we're at on it on on, on viewing on viewing how we're gonna. We basically just said instead of waiting thirty years or forty years or fifty years and seeing if this is gonna work, our our goal was to find to see if it worked now because. If it wasn't going to work, then then we 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 knew we were, our our business model was going to have to change much more quickly than that. Even 
you know. All right. Now you mentioned um, that there's an upper water table, and then that is Ogala. The upper yeah. water region is Ogala. We do have a deeper one uh, called the Dockham series, and and there's anywhere from zero to 350 feet of water there, and that's the water in terms of saturated thickness, a foot of water. So if you have a, it's, I'm simple math, if you have a farm that has um, 100 foot of water underneath it, that is not 100 foot of, of pure water. That's 100 foot of 15 to 17% saturated. Of, you take 15 to 17% of that saturated thickness and that tells you how much water you actually have to work with. Um, and then you learn to figure out what, you learn to do the math on figuring out what the recharge is on a given property. And, and then that gives you the math to tell you how much you can irrigate that in a sustainable fashion. So what's the what's the interchange between the uh, the Ogallala, the upper upper water table, and that that lower region of water? I mean, like uh, how do they inter interdepend on each other? Well, quite frankly, it depends on where you're located. So the upper water table, its water is coming from the surface from the Playa Lakes. And the lower water table, however, is recharging off of other areas uh, in the outcrop areas. So it may be many, many miles away from a given farm where it's going to recharge. Um, you know, you may be 60 or 80 miles from its recharge point. However, the porosity of those, of those two areas is quite a bit different. Um, Fortunately, we're, we're at our, we don't have a lot of salinity problems in our Oglala water. Uh, we start pushing some salinity problems if we drill deeper into our Dockham series. Uh, we're only drilled, of that 350 feet, we're only drilled in about 120 to 150 feet into that water table. And so on the upper portion of that, the salinity is very low. It's, it's, it's potable water like it is in, our, in the location we're at. And then you go south and west of us, uh, it quickly becomes, uh, you know, you go half a county south or more, that water quickly becomes saline and the salinity rises quite a bit. So the Dockham is kind of what a lot of people are laying their hat on long term for um, urban water in the region mm -hmm. and the irrigation water also. But it's a better scenario if you can blend those two waters together for, for whether you're talking irrigation or whether you're talking uh, municipal usage uh, or uh, livestock facilities usage because the quality, they, they by blending them, they have totally different uh, mineral contents. The Oglala water in our region is a hard water. The Dockham water is a softer water. You blend them, they blend really nicely. They, they make a much better product actually than than straight either one probably okay um well we've got we've got quite a few questions in the chat and i just want to let everyone know that um all this is being recorded we're taking the we're taking the questions down so if we don't get to your question now and i'm going to go ahead and ask one um to get it out uh, get one done um is there any regulatory agency that monitors or restricts water withdrawals from the oglala That is a that is a state by state, area by area issue. Uh, every state has different uh, water restrictions on it, and every area does. So in our area, we have a state agency called the High Plains Water District, and out of based out of Lubbock, Texas, and it monitors the wells. It's actually who who handles the transducers. Um, there's really, there are some legal limits on what they have to, what they can allow pumping on. Uh, one of the problems in our region is that there's not been any enforcement of any pumping activities at this juncture, uh, as far as limiting anyone, they're limited on paper, but they're not truly limited. Uh, of course that will change over time. And that's what, so that's what is significant about what we learned is that our water is much more compartmentalized. So. If, I'm, if my water tables are going down, I have to blame myself more than I used to. I could always say, hey, it was the neighbor doing it. 
and you know, I, I can still that still has some effect, but it's not near as much. Um, but if you can block up large properties and manage that property as 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 a con continuous unit, um, then you can balance it, and maybe you lose some on the edges. But if your overall it's going up or holding steady, then that's not an issue. Then regulatory right. doesn't really matter. I, I think that's our time. Uh, we've got question uh, for, oh, I, I just want one more quick question. Uh, what What is a breed of your sheep? Uh, our sheep are predominantly Rambouillet. Thank y'all for, for attending the session. Um, I, I really enjoyed hearing the different perspectives of cover crops in the other parts of the country. Yeah, thank you, Tom and Chris. Excellent job. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, appreciate it.